Good morning and welcome to our services here at Trinity. This is an unusual weekend. And uh, if you're a regular attender at our Hammond campus or a regular attender at our Oakleaf campus, or even perhaps if you're a regular online attender to our services, I want to welcome you. And uh, we're all together today. Now, that may seem a little bit strange. And where you are, you're not together maybe with anybody but your family. And uh, I'm hanging out with about five or six of my best friends in the auditorium. And uh, to say it's completely empty would be an overstatement, but there's about four of us inside and uh, some in the back getting ready to uh, make this production available uh, to you. So obviously we've done this for a very uh, important reason, and that is the outbreak of uh, COVID here in our city and particularly the way that it's impacted uh, our church and, and in our volunteers and uh, amongst our staff, um, we've just had a, just a, a number of people uh, contract the, the virus and uh, some are really dealing with it and have had some real uh, medical issues and some difficult things. And uh, we decided it's best to try to give ourselves a little bit of a pause. We did that last week and in, in just um, particularly on the Hammond campus. And then uh, this week felt like we just need to take that further step. I anticipate more normal schedule next week. Don't know that for sure. And uh, I appreciate how uh, Tommy uh, Carr and Daniel Riddick, our, our campus pastors, are communicating. And uh, we'll get our heads together probably Tuesday and Wednesday and really formulate Sunday plans. So again, welcome. Thanks for being here. It's just me and you uh, in this uh, moment. But hey, there's good things going on as well. And I want you to remember to pray for people that are going through some difficult times and uh, challenges in their life, particularly people with COVID. And uh, I did a funeral, sad funeral on Friday. Uh, so I've been in the side of weeping with those that, we, we, that weep. But there's a little rejoicing too. Let me show you a little picture of uh, what's happened in my life over the last um, 72 hours. This is a picture of my newest grandson. And uh, he was born on uh, Friday. And I know that you're interested and concerned. Mom is doing well. Uh, baby's doing well. And uh, grandpa's doing well, too. So if you're worried about that, all three of us, including my son, the dad, came through fine. And uh, that is Harlan Hunt Messer. And uh, he is our second grandson, third grandchild. And uh, hopefully he'll be coming home from the hospital uh, today. And it's crazy at the hospital. I was telling Pastor Tommy about that a little bit ago. It's just, just really crazy what's going on in the hospital. So again, thanks for joining us and uh, really glad that you're here. Wish we could have started this series in person. It's one, of, I think it's gonna be one of the, the most practical, insightful, fresh, and I love doing fresh things, a series, teaching series that we have. And you see this window up here, the series itself is entitled Windows into Heaven. I teach preaching as a, as a side gig to pastoring to our students at the college. And uh, we oftentimes say that a, a, an illustration is a window into the sermon. It allows you to see into it and, and you see inside it and you can see both in and out. It's a two-way um, experience. And sometimes you have to get in the sermon and look out. And sometimes you have to get outside the sermon and look in. And what we're going to do is take a glimpse. In fact, these, these parables, these teachings of Jesus are these ways that Jesus began to tell stories, use physical material stories, stories from the physical material world. And he, he told us stories that give us a glimpse into what the kingdom of heaven is really like. And when he talks about the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about where, where Jesus is ruling and reigning. And what I think these parables are designed to do is to show you the reality of what the Christian experience should really be. And sometimes you need a glimpse, a window into uh, the reality of the kingdom of heaven so that you can find out what your life is about. Now, I'm going to read this parable for you in a moment. But before we do, let me just set up the series. Some of you are familiar. You have Bibles, for example, that have, uh, we call them red letter editions. The, the words of Jesus are in red letters. Among the words of Jesus in the Bible are the parables. Most commentators believe that Jesus wrote or told 42 different parables. These parables are designed to enhance the teaching ministry of Jesus and to 
convey truth in a way that impacted hearers in, in a way that was life transforming, life changing. Let me just explain parables to you for a moment. These parables are important. They are earthly stories with heavenly meanings. Again, think about the window. We get a glimpse into the realities of heaven. And when we talk about uh, heavenly or earthly stories with heavenly meanings, Jesus was a master at taking things from the material and physical world. Today we're going to talk about the seed, right? The seed and the sower. And uh, using those to teach spiritual truth. And all around you, by the way, I believe this is true. Creation, the material world is, is teaching us about God and showing us truth. And Jesus used these earthly stories with heavenly meanings, these parables to do that. Then secondly, these parables are designed to make the teaching of Jesus, his truth, more memorable. You see, so, so uh, and, I, and I want you to just follow me for a moment. So we tend to think that everything is... is uh, is physical. It's, we think in a biological sense. And so we see things with our eyes. In, in spiritual life, in spiritual reality, um, to see with your eyes is really to believe with your heart. And it's to get the word to, to kind of take your heart and your mind together and, and make it come alive to you where all of a sudden what you get a glimpse of as you look into the window of heaven, you get a glimpse of a reality that doesn't exist out here in a way that you get it as, as clearly as it could be taught. But when you, get a, when you see it from the outside looking in, all of a sudden it becomes so apparent and so real that you respond to it. You believe it, you receive it, and it begins to change you. You remember it. So the parables, earthly stories with heavy meaning designed to make Jesus' teaching memorable, but they're also safe to safeguard the mysteries of the kingdom. Now, during this time, there's a, there's a, a wide following. Jesus has a wide following of people. He's immensely popular. But these people are coming to Jesus not because of who he is, but because of what they believe he can do for them. In fact, in a moment when I read this parable, you're going to find out that Jesus noticed that. And in order to safeguard the mysteries of the kingdom of God, in other words, not just tell people things and have them grasp it so they could use it to their own advantage. He told parables so that only those that were close to Jesus, only those whose lives were being converted could they really fully understand what Jesus was after? So today, we're going to jump into the parables. We're going to do six of these, I think, over the next uh, several weeks. And each of them, by themselves, teach a great spiritual truth. And today, we're going to teach this, the, the parable of the sower, the parable of the sower and the seed. Mark chapter 4, verse number 1. And he began to again to teach by the seaside and there was gathered unto him a, a great multitude so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land and he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine hearken or listen behold there went out a sower to sow and it came to pass as he sowed some fell by the wayside and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up and some fell on stony ground where it had not much fruit and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth. And, and when the sun was come up, it was scorched and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth uh, some 30 and some 60 and some a hundred. And he said unto them, important words now, he that hath ears to hear, now we all have ears, but not all of our ears are tuned in spiritually, let him hear. Verse number 10, and when he was alone, they that were about him with the 12 asked of him the parable. In other words, the 12 said, hey, I know what you said is really important. Explain to us what you meant by what you said. Here's the window, right? He's going to give them a glimpse. And he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. 
but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. In other words, I'm not telling everybody the same thing. I'm telling those whose hearts are already given to me, I'm going to teach them spiritual reality. They're going to experience life on a different level. That seeing that they may see and not perceive and hearing that they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins be forgiven them. And he said unto them, know ye not this parable, and how then will you know all parables? So, so here, here's this. This is the most important parable. It is the key to understanding the rest of the parables. So Jesus explains it. He gives us a glimpse. The sower soweth the word. So we know that the seed that is sown is the word of God. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and take away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so all and so endure but only for a time and afterward when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake immediately they are offended and these are they which are sown among the thorns such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering and choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, receive it, and bring forth fruit, and some thirtyfold, and some sixty, and some a hundred. Now, what I believe that Jesus is zeroing in on, what his focus in this lesson is simply this. There is a way that somebody who is truly a Christian grows and that spiritual growth and we're going to use the words life transformation we're going to use the idea of spiritual breakthrough or if you will organic spiritual growth there's a way that Christians who receive the word of God their lives are changed as they grow through the power of the word of God in their life when we talk about life transformation, it is characterized by the fact that it produces fruit in your life. That fruit, think fruit of the spirit, is being manifest in your life as the word is planted deep in your soul and the Holy Spirit comes alongside of the planted word and begins to, to shape your inner life and and you become more like Jesus, which, by the way, that's the best version of you, is to become like him. And the fruit is really just giving you visible, tangible evidence of what is happening in the invisible part of your life. Just like the fruit in a, in a the, the fruit on a, on a plant is the byproduct, it's the visible product of what's happening in the invisible life. You have an, you have an invisible life. You have, a, you have a spiritual life. It's a part of you that we can't see with our physical eye. But what's happening in the inner part of your life is going to be manifest by the fruit that comes out of it. That's the Christian life. The invisible secret part of your life is where spiritual transformation takes place. It's where the inner structure of the human heart Think the way that you, the way that you think and rationalize, the way that you feel and the way that you act are being changed because of how you receive the eternal life-giving power of the Word of God. Tomorrow, I will have been saved 41 years. August 2nd, 1980, I came to faith in Jesus Christ. It would be hard for you to understand how transformed my life is unless you knew me 41 years ago. It's not just physical maturity and life experience. It's that the inner structure, the inner desires of my life, the inner disciplines of my life, the, um, the, the, the tr character transformation that has taken place is all due to the word of God and the spirit of God coming inside of me and transforming my life. And that is what I desire for you. That's what, 
That's what our whole staff works for each and every week to pour the word of God into you so that you can experience this kind of life transformation. Let, let's take this passage apart real quick. And we're going to focus a lot of our teaching on verses 15 through 20 because that's where Jesus interprets the parable and gives us application. So let's talk about it this way. First of all, I want you to see the power of life transformation. In other words, I want you to understand and, and some of you have probably lived this out. You're frustrated in your life because you keep repeating the same bad character traits over and over again. You keep making the same bad decisions. You find yourself at a place in your life. In fact, some of you have probably had this conversation with your spouse. Your spouse, perhaps your wife has said to you, um, you never change, right? Or, um, you know, your kids say, well, you, 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 you never, you're never any different. You're always the same. You always do the, act the same way. And some of you wonder, well, can I, is it possible for me to change? Well, yes, because we're told here that there is something intrinsically powerful, dynamic about the power of the seed or the power of the word of God and the power of the gospel. Remember, the Apostle Paul said this in Romans 1 and verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power, <laughs> literally, it is the the dunamis, the power of God, the dynamite of God, that when it comes in contact with you, it can literally blow up the inner structure of your heart so you can change. Say, so what kind of power does the word have? Well, first it has creative power. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but if you go back to the very first page of the Bible, there's nothing. And not only is there nothing, there's darkness. In fact, there's a big dark hole with nothing happening. And the only thing that, that, that initiates life in any way is that the booming voice of God, the word of God says, let there be light. And everything began to change. And God in Genesis chapter 1 where there was no life in the universe, when he spoke his word, he brought about a material and physical universe with life. And that life began to pulsate through the material and physical universe, and it all came from the word of God. And if you read Genesis 1, right, you have plant life, you have animal life, and then eventually you get to human life. Now, you can't argue the fact that all of them have life. This is what I want you to get. But not all life is equal. There's things animals can do that plants can't do. Even though plants are remarkable um, creations themselves. And there's things that humans can do that plants cannot do. And the fact that there is material and physical universe around you a material and physical world that is so mysterious and marvelous and wonderful it's saying that life came from somewhere it came from the word of god now not only does the word have creative power but the word also has recreative power just as god word god's word has power to create it has the power to recreate in other words it has the ability to bring spiritual life out of deadness Lately, there's, and I, I don't even know where it came from. It's, it's not original with me. You know, we're, we're not trying to reform people here in our church. We're not trying to make sad people happy people. We're not trying to make poor people rich people. We're not trying to make, uh, you know, grumpy people uh, pleasant people. We're trying to get dead people to come back to life. We're trying to get people who are, the Bible describes them this way, dead in their trespasses and sins to experience life in Jesus Christ. See, all of us, like the plant, the animal, and humans, all of us have bios. We have the biology of life. We have physical life. But not all of us have zoe, spiritual life. You know what Jesus is talking about in, in this sower and seed illustration? Is that the word is what gives you spiritual life. It gives you another dimension of life. Remember the great born again passages? How about one we don't talk about a lot? First Peter 
1 and verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word. So the word is the seed by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The eternal word of God is what gives you spiritual life. It gives you faith to believe and receive God's gift of everlasting life. The new birth, being born again, equals new life. Or how about James 1.18, of his own will begat us, begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a first a kind of first fruits of his creature. Literally, he gave us birth through the word. It's through the word of God that we get life. Now, let me say this to you. A Christian is not better, smarter, more important, doesn't have a life on a different on a different value system because they have a spiritual life. They just have the ability to see things, look into windows and see things, look into the windows of heaven to get spiritual reality. In fact, the Bible even teaches us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that there's a difference between a natural man, a carnal man, and a spiritual man. And a spiritual man has the, the guiding influence of this Holy Spirit of God and the miraculous, eternally powerful dynamite of God, the word that comes in and brings you to life. Now look, I don't want to sidetrack, but let me explain this to you quickly. Religion and Christianity both give you life, but they give you a different kind of life. Religion will only give you a mechanical kind of life. It's what I call the do better and try harder kind of life. In other words, it gives you a list. It says, hey, if you do these things, you change. And many of you have tried and tried and tried and tried. And the more you try to do better and the more that you try to ha try harder, the further it seems that life transformation comes. What's missing is the power of the seed to be planted into the soul. I'm going to get into that in a moment. And when it gets into the soul, the seed in the soul applied to your life where you learn, and you've heard me say this so many times, preach the gospel to yourself your inner life begins to be transformed and you begin to change. So you don't keep adding to the stack of wood or bricks, mechanical growth. You actually water and fertilize the life, the biology of life, the zoe of life, and you grow up into what Christ wants you to be. That's the power of life transformation. Let's talk about the hindrances to it. Now, you know, truthfully, and, 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 and I, I, I'm glad I get to communicate to everybody today. I, I, I'm so uh, concerned about what's happening on all of our campuses. We have five Sunday morning services. And typically in an average week, I'll speak in two of those of, of the five services. And so it's rare for me to get to, to speak to everybody. I, I'm glad to do it. I, I regret that, that people are sick and we can't be meeting together. I do regret that. Well, I've been, I've been pastoring for 29 years. I've been um, I've been a Christian for, as I said, 41 years. And, you know, if, if I could pull up a stool and sit down and talk to you, you know, the conversation I have with you, I, I'd talk to you about why people don't grow in their Christian life. In fact, one of the great burdens to me is that, that there's people that have heard me preach hundreds and hundreds, and even in some cases, thousands of sermons. And sometimes I wonder if the word has, has even made the, 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 the smallest impact on their life. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical, and I don't mean that to be disparaging of anybody. There's so many people that look like Christians, they act like Christians, they even have a desire to be a good Christian, but they're fruitless. Their, their life is literally just, just, it's a shell. There's no real evidence of, of spiritual breakthrough or life transformation. You say, well, what's the secret the secret is this, it's how deep into your soul, how deep into the soil of your heart, the word is able to get. That, that's what Jesus is going to press on us because he doesn't tell us just about one guy who receives the word and his life becomes exponentially fruitful. He actually tells us about three other kinds of hearers that really struggle with the word coming in to change them. Jesus points out to us, and he wants you to get this, that by, by um, revealing to us that some people can come in contact with the word of God and not be changed, they hear it, they see it, they actually get a glimpse, but to them they can't see through the window. 
They, they miss the obvious because they're looking for something else. They're desiring something else. They receive it, but it makes no lasting impact. So let me, let me show you the hindrances we have, why the word, we can hear it, but not be changed by it. Jesus is going to describe for us three kinds of hearers. These are the hearts of people. I'm going to call them the soil of your own heart and why the word is hindered from bearing fruit and, and demonstrating growth in life. So first you have the shallow hearer. Now, Jesus describes him in verse 15, and these are, these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they heard it, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their heart. The word doesn't go in at all. It's surface level. The people in this category think the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they're, they're not letting the word in because literally they don't want to give up power. They don't want to surrender to the teaching of Jesus. And in fact, they're so committed to their own way that they've given room for Satan to work in their life. And so Satan comes along and snatches the word and they become, by the way, these are, these are the cynics and the critics that when they hear God's word, they have an answer and an objection. And Jesus said, you can't sit in the seat of the scornful. You cannot have such a shallow interaction with the word of God and not expect Satan to snatch the word away from you. So you not only have the this, this sh shallow um, or surface level here, but you have the superficial here. So verse 16, and these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. So initially it takes root, but because they don't have root in themselves, there's no power in their own, in the ground in which they receive it. They endure, but just for a little while. And afterward, when affliction and persecution arise for the word's sake, immediately, almost simultaneously, they are offended. See, he receives the word with joy, but that joy wears off. These are the crowds of people that are following Jesus. This is the mass of people that keeps coming to Jesus. And what they want are the miracles. They want the healing. They want the feeding. They want the prosperity. They want the, the things that Jesus can do for them. But when they find out that a commitment to follow Jesus is not about all that you get from Jesus. It's what it, it's required of you to be a follower. It's what it means to take up your cross and to deny yourself and to follow him. And they're like, no, 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 no. We don't want that part of the deal. We want the fun side of it. We want the healing. We want the miracles. We want the prosperity. But when the word offends, they're out. They're gone. They don't have any depth in themselves because the, the word didn't get deep in the soil. Then the third kind of hearer is what I'm going to call the sensual hearer. It's the hearer that has competing priorities in his heart. The seed makes it a little further, but it doesn't get past the same depth as the weeds and thorns. It doesn't get past the cares of this life consumed with your own physical life, your career, your money, your finances, your well-being. It doesn't get past the deceitfulness of riches. It doesn't get past the lust of other things. And all of those begin to choke out the word. The weed is, com is competing with the word. I, I uh, have this this is okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna go into a funk for a moment. Just stay with me. My, my front lawn is doing horrible. And I live in one of those neighborhoods, you know, where they have the yard of the month, you know, you know, the yard of the month neighborhoods. I, I am not on the short list of candidates for, for the yard of the month. And I've got this beautiful oak tree in my front yard that I, I allowed to get too full and it, and it, the, the, it got so full that the sunlight couldn't get through. And I've got these bare patches in my, in my yard. And boy, I've tried everything in the world. I've done everything from, you know, mess with my irrigation to change my, my lawn care company and, and uh, get, get people to treat the lawn. I, I resodded parts of the lawn. And, and I've got this, this 
sod, this, this type of grass, that apparently it is really a, a breeding ground for weeds. And I can't get my lawn to grow because my, my weeds and my lawn are at the same depth. Do you know that some of you are having trouble in your life? You're not going to get Christian of the Month award if we, we weren't we giving that out in the church. But if we were, can you imagine what, all the five services we have a, we have a, a, a Christian of the Month award? You, you add on the list. If you can't get the word past the cares of this life, if you can't get the word past the deceitfulness of riches, if you can't get the word past the lust of other things, in other words, whatever it is that you're thinking about and you're holding on to and you're valuing more than the word of God, that's what's making you a sensual hearer. It's important to get what Jesus is saying. The word has power, but does absolutely no good if you do not allow the power of the word to activate itself in your life. You can know the teaching of the word of God. You can have knowledge. But until the word gets connected to the inner structure of the human heart, it won't change you. One of my all-time favorite verses in the Bible, 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word, you received which you have heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. That, that effectually worketh in you literally means that when it gets on the inside, it just begins to do something in your life that you just can't imagine. I've, I've illustrated this before, right? With our kids, you ever try to give kids medicine, they don't want it, you gotta hold their nose, you gotta pin their arms down, right? You gotta, you gotta physically abuse them. If the DCF ever saw the way I, I gave my kids medicine when they were little, I'd probably would have, they would have been in foster care. But you know why I did it? You know why I pressed past it? You know why I got past their objection? Because I knew that once the medicine got on the inside, it was going to effectually do something in them that nothing else could do. There's a remarkable place in, in Galatians, two giant Christians, Peter and Paul, theologically rich, deeply dedicated to Jesus, and they have a confrontation, a face-to-face -face confrontation. And Paul confronts Peter because Peter has been behaving in a two-faced way. When he's around Jews, he acts one way. When he's around Gentiles, he acts another way. When the Jews are there, he treats the Gentiles differently. Here's what Paul confronted Peter about. He said, you're not walking uprightly according to the gospel. You're not applying the gospel to the inner structure of the human heart to walk uprightly. That's uh, ortho pideo. Ortho, you go to the dentist to get your, your, your teeth straight or you go to a foot doctor to get your, your, your feet straight so that you can walk correctly. And, and pideo is, a, is, is the word for podiatrist, right? So we want a straight walk in line with the gospel. So we take the gospel and we push it into our hearts and we let the gospel help us to live out. You see, you apply the gospel to the way you treat people. You apply the gospel to the way you work. You apply the gospel to the way you give. You apply the gospel to the way you spend your money. You apply the gospel to your emotions and you're going to find that the word is going to explode into fruit in your life. Number three, real quick, the keys to the life transformation. Let, let's just jump back up into this, what I think is a little bit more the difficult part of this. Verses nine through 13. And what Jesus really wants these disciples to do is experience a fruitful life. A life that is so radically transforming that their fruit would be astonishing. And it's not just adding to your life, it's multiplying. It's the 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. The real secret is how do you hear and apply God's word to your life? How do you preach the gospel to yourself? Let me give you just three takeaways, just three insights. We're done in just really four minutes. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be closing down the service. How do you take the word of God and activate life transformation? What's the secret? What's the key? First of all, you've got to cultivate good ground for the word. And here's what I mean by that. You have to hear the word, receive it, verse 20, and bring forth good fruit. Can I tell you something? You and I are only recipients of the word of God because of God's grace. We ought to be marveling that God, by his grace, brought the word to us. And when you're grateful, you're gonna, if you literally, if you follow me, you're gonna literally hang on every word. 
you're going to see that every word of God has the potential to be life changing. And so when you think about the word, you got to cultivate how your soul is hearing and responding and receiving the word of God. Just like you got to prepare your ground to, to your garden to plant, you got to prepare your heart to hear. Number two, you got to be intentional about hearing. Jesus said in verse nine, let him that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Make a point to listen to the voice of God. Can I tell you something? God's speaking. The problem is not that God is not speaking. The problem is that we with the spiritual ears to hear are not hearing. See, there's something in the word of God for you. Find it. Study it. Hunger for it. Thirst after it. Prioritize it more than anything else. And ask Jesus to tune you in to his radio frequency so that your heart by faith can hear the word of God. And then finally, I love this, seek intimacy with Jesus. See, in verse 12, the disciples come to him and they say to him, actually verse number 10, they asked him of the parable. They said, hey, you, you just taught this truth. It's really good, but, but tell us what it means. Do you, you know what that, I, this, is a, this is such a great truth. I said this to somebody the other day. In fact, I, I, was, I said this to my son the other day. I said, here's a secret to people whose, whose lives are remarkably different that God uses. They're all the people that have an intentionality about getting as close to Jesus as they can possibly get. That, that's the point. The disciples said, hey, Jesus, I don't want to just look in the window. I want to look in the window and see. I want you to tell me, what is it I'm seeing? How does, how does that apply to me? How can that impact me? You've got to have a desire to get close to Jesus. See, the real secret, what lies at the motivation of your relationship with Jesus Gordon Allpoint said, extrinsic faith is serving God for what he can do for you. That is serving God to get things. But intrinsic faith is serving God to get God. Serving God for his own sake. A couple of weeks ago, we had a new members uh, fellowship and I've, I've loved doing these. And I get to hear the stories of people. People hear my story all the time. I mean, I'm, people get sick and tired of hearing from me. I don't want to hear from people. So I was talking to, to Joe, um, and Joe's the guy here on the on my in the picture. He's on my uh, left. That as I look at the picture, he's on the right in the red shirt. Joe's been faithful in our church for a while. True story. <clears throat> got saved as a young person. Life never really had any spiritual fruit. Got hanging around with the wrong people, committed armed robbery, I think in Daytona, was sentenced to uh, 10 years in prison, served seven years in prison. He's about to get out of prison, met one of the guys on our staff, and we, we take some prisoners at times, put them through our program at the farm. Joe went down there and uh, went completely all the way through our program. And uh, he's just, I mean, he, he, he serves in our church. He's, he works in hospitality. He's just a great guy. Works a great job here in the city. Runs a, a crew for a guy, business owner that I know well. And I said, Joe, what, what was it that finally took root in your life? How, how did your life really get change? He said, well, it started when I went to prison. He said, I figured there was, you know, you either got in the violent crowd or the nonviolent crowd. The nonviolent crowd was the Christians. He said, I started hanging around with Christians. He said, I didn't want to be in the violent crowd. He said, but when I got to your church, he said, I started listening to you preach. Now listen to this very carefully. He said, I took the teaching of the word of God seriously. I really hungered for it. He said, and then I heard you make a statement. He said, and the truth is I never really grew until I learned the difference between finding God useful and finding God beautiful. He said, all my life, I was trying to figure out, God, what is it that you owe me? What can I get from you? And he said, I finally saw it where I just want God himself. See, that's, that's the key. That's what gives you insight. That's what begins to actually loosen your grip on everything so that you can receive the word and the word can change you. Well, I want you in this series to get a, a glimpse 
into the teaching and the reality of the kingdom of God. I want you to see into the window of heaven. I want you to see that Jesus can give you a life that is so transformed, so fruitful, that it's so impacting, not only on you, but on others. Would you pray with me? Let's bow our heads together. In a moment, our band's going to come back and, 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 and sing a powerful song. It's, it's on the blessing. And really what we want you to do, some of you in really difficult places, we want you to be blessed in your life. Be blessed through the word. Be blessed through the great worship you get here in church. Be blessed by being connected to church fellowship. And if you're looking for a deeper connection, would you communicate with us? Would you just, would you just reach out to us on, on either online or, or in the office and, and say, hey, look, I'm looking for a church. I'm looking for somebody to help me on my spiritual journey. Lord, as we come to the end of the service today, we thank you for the teaching of the word of God, the truth that we find in it. And even though it seems like a, a, a different kind of experience, me preaching to an empty room and people sitting at home listening when it's normally in a congregational setting, I pray that we would have ears to hear like we've never heard before. I pray that you'd allow us to get a glimpse into the window of heaven like we've never seen before. And that we would be prepared to receive the blessing that you have for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Enjoy this song.